Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plater. And the man who leaves me uncomfortably numb is Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save your money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Now then, Dave, how are we? I'm very good, thank you. I'm excited, you know, today, and not just because this is the finale of the current series. That in itself is quite exciting. It's something of a milestone, but I'm excited about who we have to help celebrate this final episode. Well, like you say, our guest today brings the curtain down on the current series of Fueling Around. And as a gentleman, we've wanted to, you know, to speak to for this show since, since series one, which, can yeah. you believe, is 60 episodes ago. And they said it would never last. <laughs> well, I know, and there's been a few odd ones along the way, that's for sure. <laughs> He's a musical legend and one of the founding members of the epic band Pink Floyd. He's got a car collection that is quite simply breathtaking. It is, of course, the one and only Mr Nick Mason. Hi, Nick, how are we? Uh, we're very well, thanks. Thank you very much for joining us. As Jason says, we've sort of been on your tail somewhat for uh, for a while, so it's uh, it's lovely to meet you in person and have you join us. I know that yourself and Jason have met over the years a few times. Where did your paths first meet? Presumably car-related, I suspect. Uh, yes, unless um, Jason was ever working as a road manager. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they wouldn't put me in charge of a big truck, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I, you know, I guess it would have been, uh, you know, at some circuit. I, well, it almost certainly been Silverstone, I think. Yes. Um, but sort of quite when, when and when, I have no idea. No. A f- mm. few years ago, I was certainly, I didn't have grey hair, or silver as I call it now. <laughs> Sterling. <laughs> so, so, Nick, um, uh, I mean, are you in full production mode now at the moment for the tour in June? Uh, because, you, you know, your, your current band, Nick Mason, Source Full of Secrets, had set hit the road again. I mean, goodness <laughs> God. Unbelievable, eh? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I thought I'd retired about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and do you so... still get the same sort of buzz be- being up on stage in front of thousands of people? I, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I think my doctor said if you haven't grown out of showing off by the time you're 70, you're probably <laughs> incurable. It's a terminal thing. Yeah, no, but as I say, it's fantastic that, that you're that you're still doing it. For those that are unaware, the band consists of yourself, obviously, Guy Pratt, Gary Kemp from Spandau Ballet, of course, Lee Harris from the Blockheads, and keyboardist Don Beckin from The Orb. In terms of this band then, Nick, was this a hand-picked dream team for you and something that you'd wanted to put together for a while? Uh, no, uh, in a word. Um, <laughs> it, I had very little to do with it. It was, okay. I think, initially Lee's suggestion. And uh, the rest of the band sort of formed itself around us. Um, it, it, I mean, when I looked at it now, we certainly didn't do anything as crude as um, hold any sort of uh, um, test tests for... Auditions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no auditioning. That, it, it was actually, in a way, exactly how bands always used to be put together, which was a few like-minded people getting together and saying, well, let's give it a go. And that's exactly what we did. And I guess you're playing a lot of you know old, old Floyd tracks uh, as well. well. I mean, was the idea of that to introduce a new audience to some of the earlier stuff or, or just because they're great, great bits of music? A combination of things. First of all, uh, it was a repertoire that I could just about remember, which uh, <laughs> helped. Um, but the other thing was to that feeling that we wanted to sort of capture the, the, the atmosphere of the early, of the early mm. music. And that meant that Actually, it freed us up a bit because we didn't actually have to play comfortably numb exactly as it was played on the record. Yeah. We were playing the earlier songs where it was much more about the the atmosphere that went with it rather than um, uh, than the accuracy. Absolutely. And, I mean, presumably from an audience perspective, there's a lot of original Floyd fans, but, you know, is there a whole new generation that are coming through to see you? Do you know? Well, certainly... Uh, I think in a way that's one of the things that's really, really terrific is when you do get a younger fan Mm. or a fan base that sometimes come, they bring their old granny along who was, (laughs) uh, you know, the clatter of Zimmer frames in the mosh pit Mm. 
something to watch out for. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell, tell you what, my, my youngest daughter, Zia, is 14. She's just started uh, about a year and a half ago, started playing the bass guitar at school. Oh. And she's always had quite a good, a, a, like, eclectic little playlist. But I've noticed in the last eight months, she's playing Pink Floyd, you know. And it's great. <laughs> she's got, she, oh, and that's a g- genuine thing. And I'm like, where, where did you get introduced to that? Because she, I mean, she's 14 years old. But they're, they're playing all this sort, sort of stuff at school. So, it, I mean, it's ace to, it's ace mm. to see that. Yeah, no, it's it's great. And the really odd thing is the way that people are uh, adopting vinyl. Because mm, yes. um, vinyl is is now seen as the, the sort of perfect medium. Where, and CDs are now dispatched to the that, yeah. um, box of old stuff at the bottom of the garden. Well, it's still it's still the most beautiful medium, isn't it? The album, yeah. you know, with because yeah. it's analog and you get that lovely kind of richness to, to it. Yeah, no one had anticipated that be the case, but they do prefer the sound of a, a vinyl record, which is actually, yeah. I mean, in terms of sonic quality, it's nothing like as good as a, yeah. a really good digital thing. But it just is more pleasant as a way of listening. I think also it's to do with the fact that, you know, you're purchasing a piece of art and, uh, you know, and I don't, be, don't mean to be sort of too pompous about that, but as, as well as the music, you know, there's also the the physical artwork that you're getting with a with an album sleeve. And I think that's all part of the attraction and the return to vinyl these days. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to, it was very odd the way that um, CDs just miniaturized all mm. those album sleeves. And of course, once you're over about 17, you can't, you can't make out what the graphics are. <laughs> Your arms aren't long enough, are they? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Nick Mason, Saucer Full of Secrets, kick off their UK tour on the 11th of June at the Victoria Hall in Stoke, and we'll be visiting York, Nottingham, Oxford, Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Gateshead, Cardiff, Poole, Brighton, and Ipswich before performing at the Royal Abbott Hall on the Saturday, the 29th of June, which will be epic. You must be looking, I mean, listen, you'll be looking forward to all of them, but the Royal Abbott Hall at the end will be something else, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great venue, and I mean, we well, we didn't actually start playing there, but we'd certainly in 1966 did a charity event playing there. So it's it's somewhere we've been revisiting for 60 odd years. (laughs) Hey, so anyway, promotion out of the way. Let's get on to the main course because we, you know, we've all got this love of cars. So um, Nick, if you don't mind, straight away, what's in the current Nick Mason car collection now, and what are you currently driving as your every day? Uh, well, we'll start with the every day, which is a Golf R, which okay, uh, yeah, right, um, which is just a really good, great, use, useful car. Mm. Um, well, funnily enough, the, the latest car it might be the most unlikely uh, because it's a replica, uh, right. the original car no longer exists, um, of an 1895 Benz, which is basically seen as the first motor car ever. Wow. And wow. some years ago, uh, a guy called John Bentley actually made 12 of these, I think. Um, I think as a the idea was for a couple of museums, probably the Mercedes Museum in particular, mm. who wanted this replica. And it seemed, sim- I think, wh- while he was doing it, he thought, actually, I'll make a bunch of these. And they are the most amazing thing because they do work. You can. Do they? Uh, uh, unfortunately, not entirely road legal, so I won't be turning <laughs> up to that grand <laughs> premiere. I'm just, I'm just lo- looking at a picture with one now. Is it? it that's got like, um, it's got almost got like a, like a parasol roof on it. Is that is that right? That one, um, like penny farthing style wheels. Uh, it, what it should look like is a sort of Victorian pram. Yeah, yeah. So the original one is is no longer. That's dead. That's gone, has it? Yeah, that's gone. But obviously uh, they had the drawings and some pictures of it and so on. And um, yeah, uh, I think it was Mercedes themselves who commissioned the making of the, this um, this replica. I haven't driven it yet. I have to be honest, but I'm told it's. Just as frightening as any super high. <laughs> All three and a half horsepower of it. You go yeah. steady. <laughs> you can still, you know perfectly well, you can have an absolutely terrific accident. Really quite oh, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, famously, the car collection consists of the Ferrari 250 GTO. Aside, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Aside from that, what else is, is there? Or, or rather, where did the collection begin, Nick? Well, the first thing to say is that I never intended to be a car collector. Okay. I actually wanted to go amateur motor racing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so, actually, the first car that I, I raced and still have is a pre-war Aston Martin, mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. an Aston Martin Ulster. And um, <laughs> as with all motorsport, there's always that mad idea that if you have your own garage, you will, <laughs> you won't have to pay to go motor racing. Yeah, which is so wrong. <laughs> oh, it couldn't be further from the truth, could it? <laughs> but, but I did, But it was fun, and uh, so I started with the with the um, Aston. Still got it, as I say, uh, and then sort of gradually worked my way up through some historics, and finally decided that uh, in '79 mm-hmm. that what I'd really like to do would be some more modern racing. And you went to was that your first year at Le Mans? Which, yeah. which I have to say, you came second in class. Remarkable achievement. <laughs> yes, probably a mistake on the part of the organisers. But <laughs> no, it was it was terrific. It was everything I wanted to do, really. And and do you remember your first motor racing style me- memory as a kid? Um, you know where, where where it first you know lit that torch in your head. Oh yeah, but that was inevitable because my dad was very into motorsport, mm, yeah. um, and he actually worked for Shell as a film director, okay. making documentaries mainly about cars and motorsport, and mm-hmm. eventually did a a sort of five part um, history of motor racing. And he used to race himself, so I was taken yeah. to Silverstone in the fifties, I guess, mm. uh, and Lord. sort of. That was the introduction. And have you still got you've still got one of his old cars? Have you the the, the Bentley four yeah. four four? Yeah, the four and a half litre. Yeah, absolutely. Good God, uh, amazing! And it was terrific. You know, the big treat was uh, to go to Silverstone early Saturday morning, and pick up. He had a uh, the guy who actually looked after the car was a guy called Wally Saunders, who'd actually been one of the original Bentley mechanics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, full of fantastic stories of of that sort of era. Oh, uh, the Bentley boys, amazing yeah, times, right? Yeah. So I guess then, Nick. So when you were, I guess, when Pink Floyd were enjoying their early fame and success, and all that goes with that, were you seeing the personal fame being something that might facilitate your racing career? I didn't really initially make the connection because the okay. sort of racing I was doing was unlikely to produce big sponsors. There's something mm-hmm. about a five lap handicap that just doesn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And so I loved doing it, but I just really kept it separate. Plus right. the fact that we actually worked really hard for that sort of a, the first four or five years. Mm. Uh, and there was very little money coming in certainly not enough to do any any anything more serious than yeah. than vscc racing yeah and, and who, and who it, was your first hero oh sterling i think Love it. Yeah, i mean it. i actually God bless him. my dad took me to one of the grand prix at silverstone when uh, sterling was racing um and fangio in fact yeah yeah uh and i think sterling sort of remained a hero Forever, throughout. Same, say, 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 same with me. A, a, a true, true hero, that man. But God mm. bless him. No, absolutely. Um, I think we need to talk about the aforementioned GTO. Um, you purchased this in 1978. Was that right? Yeah, uh, I can never remember if it was the end of 77 or 78, but um, that kind of era. That yeah, that era. One of 39 cars at the time that were in existence. Is that right? Yeah. That, uh, people still argue about whether there's really 36 or whether you count, um, you know, which ones you count. But there are, yeah, yeah. There are no more barn finds, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And without talking exact figures, it's fair to say that that car is worth significantly more now than it was on the day that you purchased it. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw there was a there was a lovely there was someone else to fill in the, the, the details. <laughs> Absolutely, I saw a, a lovely little film from a few years ago when Brian Johnson, who's also been on here and and joined us uh, for a chat about cars, predictably, and he came to visit you and you took him for a little ride out in the two hundred and fifty GTO. And I have to say that Brian looked like a little boy on Christmas Day. I mean, he <laughs> looked so excited. It was incredible. It was just uh, it was just a lovely thing to. To see i mean you know as someone who's into cars like yourself for him to be in there and just smell and hear that car was just something else i think one of the wonderful things about the gto is that it has that effect on, not only on all the, the sort of people who get a ride in it but on mm. me you climb yeah. into it and you just think this is magic i yeah, mean it's the cool. ultimate gentleman's racing car or if not a gentleman, at least a sort of wide boy, because it just, um, it, it's, it, it's a really nice balance of power against road holding mm. and so on. Mm. And um, so, yeah, so nice to drive, easy to drive. I mean, I really appreciate that now when you can sort of climb into some hypercar and um, go incredibly quickly, but it, half the time, the, cars ahead of you yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the great thing about the gto is you're more or less w you're with it mm. yeah mm. yeah I, I i was given the opportunity to, to race one maybe five six years ago at the revival and i did the test day there and it was a real real moment for me but it's a sad ending because in the week leading up to it i i put my back out on, on a on a mountain bike accident and, and couldn't, mm. I had to pull out. Really? It was, uh, oh, it was so, and I was, I, I remember sat on the sofa here watching good, good one on the TV <laughs> in all sorts of pain. And I had to turn it off. I couldn't watch. Tom Christensen <laughs> ju jumped yeah. in for me and he won the race. And I had to, after like two or three laps, I turned it off and just sat there in, the, in a foul mood. But you're right. It's an amazing <laughs> bit of kit, isn't it? And you yeah. feel at home, albeit I was a bit too tall because it's quite cramped in there, isn't it? But amazing bit of kit. Well, nothing that an operation on your feet couldn't do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, get your priorities right. Yeah. Here's a question then. I mean, would that would that be your favourite in the collection or is it a bit like kids? You, you can't, you don't have a favourite. Yeah, I, it's uh, it's not that you don't have a favourite, but the, they do different things. So mm. I have always say that I've got three favourites. Um, the first is the Aston Martin because it was the first car I raced. Yeah. Uh, and... My kids have raced it, and we've still got it. Um, mm. So that's great. Um, I have to say, the other one is a birdcage Maserati, mm -hmm. because I had my best race ever in that. Okay. I won the support race to the Silver, uh, to Grand, the Grand Prix in 93, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And I won it. I won it. I hope, I hope he hit it listens to this to remind him of that day frank sitner i beat frank yeah. on the last corner of the last lap oh no that is a way to win a race isn't it yeah. <laughs> i you know what i'll confess i still occasionally watch the video <laughs> <laughs> and what and absolutely it's i'll get a text frank it. later and remind him yeah. of that <laughs> <laughs> No, it's shameful, but I'd actually watched the video thinking, oh, I think I know, <laughs> I know what's <laughs> going to happen here. Next. <laughs> and the GTO finally. Yeah, the GTO. GTO's the third, the third car, just yeah. because of what I was saying earlier about it does everything. Mm. Though someone did point out, they said, is it the best investment? I was saying, you know, fantastic investment and so mm. on. Yeah. Uh, and someone said, yeah, but actually probably the uh, £7.50p that you bought your first jump kit with yes. is a better investment. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, and m much overlooked is that one. But yeah, you're right. All eyes go to the GTO, don't they? But actually without the, the drum kit, without Floyd, yeah, you know, none of this perhaps GTO would have been possible. So. Uh, yeah. But here's the thing, though. In terms of the investment, it's not such a good investment after all, because you'll never get rid of it because it's such a beautiful thing. So you're never <laughs> yeah. going to really, do you know what I mean? So it just sits there, which yeah. is a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, actually, Nick, sort of on that front, you know, GTO aside, but is there is there movement within the car collection? Are you one of those people that can have something for a while and then feel that you're sort of 
done with it and then move it on? Or are you a keeper whereby once they become part of the family, they never leave? Uh, definitely the keeper. Mm. Yeah. I, I regret almost uh, selling almost every car I've ever uh, yeah. uh, sold. Um, thinking about it, I, I do believe that uh, one should really keep the cars that you use mm. rather than uh, keep everything. But it's very hard sometimes to part with them. And you know, I did, I did sell uh, an HC Alpha that I had. And I had to sell it to pay some income tax, but I now know I should have gone to prison and kept the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a quote and a half, isn't it? That's brilliant. I love that. I was going to say to you, when we were talking before about the likes of Goodwood and, and Silverstone and, and sort of classic meets where you have the opportunity to go and race your, your beautiful cars. Are you ever able to relax properly when you are racing something which is very valuable and, and well, arguably priceless in terms of what it means to you? Or do you always have half a, an eye on the fact that you just don't want to damage it? I think once you get out on the track, you really just don't think about <laughs> that. Mm. I mean, I, <laughs> I've, I've never thought, oh, I'm, I think I'll back off a bit. Okay. Um, Maybe I should not admit that. <laughs> maybe i should go or or yes it's always at the back of my mind but nick's yeah. right what well, once you're out there and you and you know if you're on your own you can have that mindset where you know i'm just on the limit i'm not too much over it but once once you actually start racing someone mm, all yeah. those all those thoughts of i've got to look after this car they kind of go to the back of your mind don't, don't they absolutely got, why have i said that why have i said that <laughs> i think the other thing is that a little bit of um, sort of battle damage is mm. acceptable. There was, I had a very good moment with Martin Brundle when he was driving the car, and he he actually asked me the question. He said, "How do you want me to drive it, more or less? Mm. Yeah. 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 How how careful should I be?" And I said, "Well, I definitely don't want you um, bringing the car back looking like this." And it was. It was polished beyond belief, ready yes. for, the, for the outing. Yeah, I said, uh, you know, you you need to go and race it, not that red rag to a bull. That 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 is in my my terminology. But interesting enough, I, with this GTO that, that that I was racing, I met the mm. owner on, on the test day, and I said a similar thing. I said, look, if I'm racing things, it's not it's not the three B's principle, is it? And he looked at me and said, you know. Bob, borrow it, bend it, buy it. I said, because I, I, I can't. And he said exactly the same as you. He said, oh, no, honestly, race it because the value yeah. is in the car. Panels mm. and stuff can be, can yeah, be tickled and fettled. Absolutely yeah. right. And I think one of the things I'd say is that you know, there are so few of these cars, but the owners are all pretty committed drivers. Yeah. And yeah. there was a really nice thing. About, every five years, they have a rally just for GTOs. Mm. And at one point, there was a day out at a circuit somewhere, and the organizers were sort of saying, have, a, have any of you done any racing or whatever? Um, and almost every hand went up <laughs> yeah. having, a, <laughs> having a race license. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I thought that was interesting it yeah. was about maybe wealthy people but their, their commitment to motorsport was was there absolutely and i mean for me personally nick and obviously you've got some beautiful and, and varied cars in your collection what is it specifically about ferrari for you what is it about that as a mark i think well it's the fact that they they were there a long time ago, and they've mm. actually stayed. Yeah, you know, even Mercedes drop in and out, uh, or have dropped in and out over over the years. And that commitment, and the and the mystery of it, and the the romance, you know, mm. sometimes pretty sort of bleak uh, with the accidents and so on. Yeah. There's a there's a sort of story there that mm. that's important. Um, I mean, having said that, uh, you know, I, my I'm a bit of a tart, really. I, the, um, uh, the you know the Birdcage Maserati is possibly the best racing car of of all the cars that I've yeah. got. And, and I'm assuming you 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 would have met 
a few times actually commander Tory, you know at enzo tell us a wee bit about that if of course you did well uh, sadly i'd have to say i didn't meet him oh um but that was made up by, for by my father who did and uh, when he was actually making a film about the Melia Melia. And um, uh, uh, the old man actually organized for my dad to get an Italian race license and r- drive with a, um, a privateer in a mm-hmm. Ferrari to, and did the race with a camera strapped to him. Oh, my word, wow. It's that great thing where... Uh, if you know the right people, you can get a competition <laughs> license from the post office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know, I remember the first time, met, you know, a long t- time ago now, Fit Filming was l- l- lucky enough to go to Fiorano and then went, you know, was sh- shown around Enzo's, uh, you know, his apartment there on the circuit. Yeah. And his room is left in exactly this, as it was the day he died, you know, in his purple, his purple pen, because really? he wrote everything in purple, is mm. on the desk. And you know there yeah. was what there's one picture, what one fa- photo in a frame on his desk, and that's a v- Villeneuve who, who is his uh, yes. almost like, like like his replacement son, if you like. Mm. But yeah. it's a, it's a it's a it was a real mo- moment to walk into that room and God, it it just felt like it was like it was yeah. back in the day, and of course it it, it is, and it, yeah. it's, it's flat. His house was on the circuit, amazing. Have you seen the movie? Yes. What the new one? Yeah. I didn't like it, if I'm really honest. Mm. Didn't I just no? It didn't no, do I anything for me. A number of people, uh, you either sort of go for it or, or not. Yeah. But since we'd supplied a car for it, I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> what was I understand that? What was it, Jason? Though about it, you know, was it just? It just felt a bit hot Hollywoody. It just okay. didn't feel real, you know, and it was a bit overacted. Some of the car scenes were just ridiculous mm. in terms of... I, I mean, it's probably because I can see it, A, from knowing how TV and stuff is made, yeah. which is a bad thing, actually, because it ruins some of the, the you know, the, the, the glamour of, of what TV is about. Mm. But also being involved in motor racing and, and knowing, well, actually, that, that can't... That, that little clip i've seen there there's no way that can turn into a car going you know up in the air 60 foot yeah. it just was make-believe for me yeah but that's probably my, my because of, you know because of my experience in the game yeah. i guess well we're, we're particularly fond of the film because um not only did we lend a car but we also sent my son-in-law to drive it yeah marina and, yeah and they suddenly realized that um they were short of someone to play castellotti so Marino was then co-opted yeah, cast. <laughs> yeah. to become a film star, and <laughs> which we were, we were thrilled with because Castellotti had a lot of hair. And Marino, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got not much. <laughs> yeah, some great still shots of Marino trying on various different wigs. <laughs> oh, please, let us have some of those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> As yet, I've been unable to prize them out. Away. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Do you still um are you still a fan of modern day racing and modern day Formula One, Nick? I mean, uh, in you know, Lewis obviously going to Ferrari. Did that uh, did that sort of um pique your interest? I think for me, Formula One is still the peak of mm. of the whole business of business. And uh, whether it's being fought out by the drivers or fought out by the designers. Mm. Uh, it's, it's all part of that same thing, you know. Yeah. If if someone, if um, well, any of the teams can actually hold it together to to win year by year, I think it doesn't make it boring. It makes it even more about the best of the best. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Formula One, and I'm uh, over the years sort of been fortunate enough to go to quite a lot of the races and it's always pretty intense yeah do you know what go, talk, talking about the lewis and ferrari thing I, you know i can remember when and actually i thought it myself for a while you know when he left mclaren to go to merck mm. I, the, most of the world went oh my god what is he doing and, and look what happened yeah and i have a funny feeling he's got the timing just bang on and i think in the very very near future we're going to see Ferrari back winning world championships again. Do you, do you, do you think that, Nick? 
Uh, yeah, I think it, it could be. You're absolutely right. But it's funny how wise you are considering what happened last weekend, where Ferrari won too. <laughs> Ah, the Obi Wan <laughs> Kenobi of motorsport. But, um, <laughs> uh, no, I think it'd be really interesting because it's it is that opportunity, and as, as you say, um, Lewis really chose well when to leave McLaren and mm, go yeah. to Mercedes. Yeah, I, I I just got a feeling. I think it's going to come become ma- magical, and also to see him and Leclerc at each other. Yeah, that's going to be that that that's going to be a real treat. I think because both you know, Charles is is real quality. I think. Yeah, no, I'd agree on that. In terms of you know, like a motoring itch you've yet to scratch, what 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 might those be? Um, well, I I am extremely old now, so I'm actually sort of enjoying. More or less being the patron rather than <laughs> uh, rather than anything else. Um, I don't know. I suppose I'd still like perhaps to go back to Le Mans as a an entrant rather than a driver. Mm-hmm. Wow, that'd um, be cool. Yeah, that's still. I mean, when I did Le Mans, it was totally brilliant because the right up the front there were the sort of professionals and the works teams and then as you went further back down the grid it was much more like a club meeting really and uh, quite a lot of dropouts which um, i mean it was it was a very different race to what it is now mm, yeah and to, i mean it really is full on now from start to finish it's like a sprint race, isn't it? Now it's yeah. just like, like you say, it's flat out, absolutely flat out. It's still on my bucket list, Jason. As we say every time, I've still never been, and uh, and I and I really need to. Every year we kind of go right. We need to make a reason to go. So uh, we'll have to we'll have to cook something up. I think. Well, get it down in the diary now. Block some dates out. Mm. Let's let's do it. We'll go. We should do. It's, we I mean, should it's do. wonderful. Yeah, the girls' spectator is, is quite something. It's yeah. a brilliant atmosphere. And actually, there's a, lot, there's a, a huge amount of Brits which go over there. I mean, maybe oh, more yeah. than any other nationality, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Would, would you say that, Nick? Oh, definitely. It's a sort of famous pilgrimage, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, interesting, because they, it is absolutely Le Mans. Uh, it's not as though you'd get the same sort of crowd at the Nürburgring. Of mm. No, and uh, talking of the Nurburgring, you took the 250 GTO over there, didn't you? Can't remember. I don't. I haven't ever raced the GTO at the ring. No. Have you raced at the? Have you raced at the old Nordschleife? Yes, I did. The, I think won the last uh, thousand races in. Must have been eighty, eighty-one, something like Tell that. Tell us about that. What's that like racing around in the, the old <laughs> Nordschleife? I mean, just insane. Mm. I was. I was lucky. I really was lucky because um, Derek Bell was driving with Steve O'Rourke and Steve, I think Steve got ill. And so suddenly I was at the ring and Derek had got the day off to sort of to give Steve a, a sort of coaching yeah. uh, trip round and um, said, oh, all right, well, we'll do it with you. So actually I had a day learning the ring, yeah. I mean, experiencing it. Was, um, was that your first time round that that day? I mean, yeah. was it from? Yes. Oh my God! Well, I, I can't imagine you'd learn in a day. I would imagine it needs much more than that. Well, I know it does. The good, the good thing was that thing about uh, returning the hire car at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? I've been off. I think three three hire cars there over the years. I've put through the gravel traps. Have you? <laughs> well, so, oh, yeah. what, what you really want to do is get, be able to go back to them and say it's good news and bad news. <laughs> and the bad news is the cars are right off. The good news is we were second in class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? I can't remember which. I mean, I can remember if I drive it now, but I can't remember the names. There's two sections on there where it looks like. On approach, like some other part of the track, <laughs> but unfortunately, these two sections are very slow. Mm. But but or, or it ends up going slow off a quick bit, and every time I've got I've got gone off is uh, I've got it wrong, <laughs> and it's 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 uncanny. It's literally it's, visibly almost identical. Yes, there are. You're, you're absolutely right. That's, I remember that thing of thinking: is it left or right? <laughs> 
<laughs> when I get over this hump. And of course, the other thing is in the Harkai, you're about another foot higher. Yeah. So you see a lot more. So yeah. suddenly you're back down in a, a sort of race car thinking, now where? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you get that horrible feeling. We've all ha had it, you know, even on the road where, when you're about to, you think you're going to have a shunt. You get that rush of whatever it is. I think it must be adrenaline, which goes up your chest and floods your brain. <gasps> yeah. But that's nearly every other corner there, isn't it, round the ring? <laughs> yeah. that, well, you get that feeling. <laughs> As, aside from there, Nick, other favourite tracks that you've raced? Are there any personal favourites for you? Well, I thought Laguna was quite fun. Mm. I think it's that thing where you just... You know, if you have the opportunity to go motor racing and you want to go motor racing, yeah, it's that's it. There's something a bit magic about Le Mans and the, the old Nordschleife and so on. Mm, yeah, but, yeah. But actually, just being out there, uh, you know, the Club Silverstone with three mm. corners, really. Yeah. Um, if you're out there, it's <laughs> it's sometimes quite alarming, but in other ways, it's it's everything you ever wanted. I was going to say, it's all you need, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, talking about Silverstone, I can remember the first time I went there with my dad in 76. And I can remember that moment. He, he was uh, working with BMW at the time. It was a, you know, he had a, a dealership. So we had hospitality and like centre parking. And I didn't know any, what any of that was. But I can remember driving through the gates in a, in a, in a, in a brown, I think it was a 635 or something, thinking, oh my God. We're driving in, to, you know, into Silverstone, and you know, years gone by. You know, I haven't been a director of the place for ten years, mm. and I don't know. I, but hundreds of thousands of times I've been to that gate. I still get that feeling, yeah. you know, when when going into that place. You know, you, it, and I guess I guess the same for you, Nick. It's so, it's somewhere special, isn't it? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, my mine's a sort of <laughs> the art of course motor racing. <laughs> Would be the way of describing it. Yeah. Uh, pretty shambolic at times, but uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I concur. <laughs> but uh, I'd look back on it and just um, loved it. And I have to say, you know, one of the great things about it are, are the the other people who do it. Mm, you know, yes. in general, fantastically helpful. You know, until you actually get out there. Uh, but in in terms of assistance when something's wrong with the car or whatever, fantastic. And also, I think Silverstone has the best fan base of, mm -hmm. of any Grand Prix. I I think. Yeah, yeah. There's, some, there's something really special about it, isn't there? Yeah. Do you know what I think? I think a lot, lot, lot of it goes back to the you know the Mansell time. You know, when the first time that the circuit was. You know, there was that circuit invasion and then he gave Cesar oh, yeah. a lift back on his side pod. Mm. I think I think that's been a catalyst, if you like, for, you know, the the, the British fan and certainly what has happened over re recent years with L Lewis. It's an amazing experience, yeah. an atmosphere to be there. No, I, I think that's true. And uh, again, it, it has its own history with particularly Sterling mm. uh, with the British Grand Prix and... Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of history there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nick, before we let you go, actually, uh, much as we've talked about the the incredible cars in in your collection, I'm still intrigued by the everyday car in a really good way because I think it's always interesting what you know when you have things like you have in the garage. I think that your choice of everyday thing is actually because on the basis that you could almost have anything. What is it about the Golf R? Because I, too, think it's pretty perfect, actually, in yeah, so yeah. many ways. It does everything well, doesn't it? Yeah, and it, that slightly smaller car means it's just that little bit easier to wheel around town. Yeah. yeah. But there's, it's very easy to load it up and carry a bunch of stuff. And it, it sort of does everything that... If you head for big cars... As far as I'm concerned, I'd like to sit in the back and read the paper. Yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that depresses me slightly is the fact that all these cars now just get bigger and bigger. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, for me, I'd really like uh, Ferrari to turn out another Dino. Mm. Yes. Because all these other things, are, they're big. Yeah, mm. they are, aren't they? Do you know what? I saw a picture the other day online uh, of, of an old original Mini 
parked in a car, an outside car park yeah. in between the lines next to yeah. a modern Mint Mini. Mm. And actually, I thought the picture had been doctored because because <laughs> it's it's one's enormous. But if you yeah. look at all cars, you're right; they've all just got huge, haven't they? It's it's obesity. Yeah. 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 I actually, only yesterday, Jason, I saw the biggest Mini I've ever seen in my life. And by that I mean, and it must be it must be a new model, unless my eyes were deceiving me, because it definitely had a Mini badge on the front, but it was far bigger than the Countryman or anything like that. Have they brought oh, really? out like a, a Mini 4x4 or something? It was huge. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. But as you say, when you see the original ones now, they do. They, they look like toys, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah they do. Uh, still, but but I tell you, to get back in an old like Cooper S, yeah. Oh, they're just yeah. great fun to drive. Yeah. They're just brilliant. the way you bounce around, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, look, Nick. Th- th- this is this next question is a question we we ask all our guests, but actually, I can't think of a perfect guest to ask this question to. So he goes. We always think that music and cars go well together. So we. We'd like to ask you what your fantasy drive would be. So where where are you? Where are you going? What are you listening to? But most importantly, what are you driving? Roth. Probably. Probably the F40. Mm. Yes. That's because in terms of excitement, that car has probably frightened me more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, particularly if it starts raining, which it normally does as soon as you climb into it. Mm. Yeah. Probably be going to a, a race of some sort, mm. um, whether spectating or um, perhaps... I'd, funnily enough, actually, the drive to Le Mans is, is good. Yeah. yeah. And what's on the eight track? <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe Walsh, I think. Okay. Something. Uh, I mean, I'm going to write that down because I'm not fami- familiar with Joe Walsh. I'm going to write that down and check that out. Uh, American sort of Eagles type mm, from the Eagles. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so here's, here's another little question: Do do you ever listen to your own music? Or is that something no. which you just no only, ne- never? I mean, only if I'm sort of relearning or doing yeah. something. Mm. I've I've heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you, you hear it when, when yeah. you're doing gigs and stuff. You're you're in it. Yeah, I've never really thought about that. I suppose you know most artists probably the last thing they want to listen to is their own work a lot of the time. Yeah, because it's uh, you tend to the trouble is you tend to listen to it critically. Yeah. You know, and you think, oh, why did I do that? Or yeah. why did we do this? Or, mm. you know, we should have put one more verse in or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I suppose it's like uh, it's like chefs cooking at home. They never mm. do, do they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, Jason, I think on that note, I think you need to take us out. Well, sadly, that is it for, for, for this show, but also for the series. Um which is a shame. But anyway, thanks for listening to Fueling Around, powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, as always, thanks to you. But a huge thanks to our special guest this week, the one and only Mr. Nick Mason. Thanks, Nick. My pleasure. Nick, it's been fantastic having you on board. Thank you very much. Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plater or at David Vitti. And if you like what you've heard, feel free to give us a five-star rating, press the follow button and share the podcast on all your socials. Well, that's it. This is the end of the current series. Hope We hope you've enjoyed it. And, um, well, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for now. Listener.